plays together with our differential geometry. All right. I'm skipping over that section from Kunal. I'm going straight to the results from O'Neill. All right. And um, so we'll do that. Now, so a question for you guys. Do you want me to do it right now? Or would you prefer that I stop here and make a video? You don't care? I will continue on then. <laughs> you don't care. You don't care? All right. All right, well, let me get to it then. Um, let me let me go get to it then. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean this this stuff is really it's really breathtaking. Like the, the the marriage of analytic geometry and then coming out to say something so interesting about groups, like that there's this you know group theory. Have you guys talked about subgroups yet? No. In fact, a subgroup of a group is a subset of a group which is itself a group with respect to the operations which are already there. It's just what you think it is. Ah, yes. Um, so, in fact, the um, well, the, the composition of trans the composition of translations is again a translation. So, if you take the subgroup of translations, that's a group, a subgroup of the group of uh, isometries. You could just look at rotations. If you compose a rotation with a rotation, you get another rotation because the determinant of two matrices with determinant one yeah. is still a matrix with determinant one. So the rotations also form a subgroup of the Euclidean group. And there's also the orthogonal transformations. Those also form a subgroup of the Euclidean group. And each one of these subgroups has another, has a, has a specific geometric, um, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. Sorry, were you still writing? All right, I'll stop. I'm gonna stop. I was, I was, I was just starting to. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you were saying. So then, there's a separate question, right? Which is. What what objects are are, are what objects are preserved under the isometries? Like, wh what is an example of something that I can? Well, well distance, is preserved. distance is preserved, right? Um, but yeah, we're. I, I'm not sure if I have a good answer to your question right off the top of my head. Well, maybe we'll maybe we'll stumble back into the answer to your question as we go on here. So let me forge ahead. So next up is how isometries act on vectors, right? So so just some reminders. We had what alpha prime of t equal to what was it? Sum i equals one to n of d alpha i dt partial partial xi at alpha t. This is the velocity vector in the uh, you know annoying notation. And if we have f a mapping from Rn to Rn, then the push forward, well we can compose f with alpha and we can calculate the derivative of that, right? And that gives us um, this um, <clears throat> and then okay so by the chain rule we can unwrap that further sum over i and j and I get like partial f i um, partial xj 
of f of alpha of t. Ugh, such a mess. Let me not write that. <laughs> partial f, partial xj. And then um, d of, what was it here? Alpha i dt. That's the chain rule here. And then partial, partial xi. at um, hmm. alpha of t, apparently. That feels wrong. I think that's a typo. That should still be f of alpha of t. Yeah. Well, I guess it doesn't, that's the thing, is this is the Cartesian basis. I guess I could go either way. Hmm. Well, in any event, this is equal to d alpha of t, f of alpha prime of t. I think I was writing this as alpha of t, so I could see that. <sighs> that's, that's an i, my... These are all I's. There's no ones here. Um, and then I'm like, okay, so essentially the theorem is just this. The push forward of the velocity vector is the derivative of the push forward path, right? That was essentially our definition of push forward, but I mean, our, our, I gave a coordinate-based definition, but this is the result. But um, so, okay, so if I take a step back and look at this um, in a different way, if I identify Think about this as being like vector x. And I think about all of this as being like, let's say, vector y. If I just think about components of it, then we could look at this formula. Um, come on. We can look at this formula simply as y equals to the Jacobian of f times x. Um, so the of what In other words, f star. So I'm abusing notation a little bit here, but um, the Jacobian was um, like partial f, partial x1, da 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 partial f, partial xn. It's the what? It's the partial? Um, well, I, I don't know. Um, probably best for me to give an example. If f of, you know, x1, x2 is x1 squared minus x2, x1, x2, then the Jacobian of f is uh, 2x1 minus 1, 2x1 rather, x2, and then next up, partial x2, I get minus 1, I get x1. So that's the Jacobian matrix for that transformation from R2 to R2. Oh, goodness gracious. <sighs> Sorry. Oh, so you're saying, okay. 
I'm trying to be consistent in my jibber jabbering here, but yeah. Thank you. Where the what? The. So this is. There's only two coordinates here, so it's partial f, partial x1, partial f, partial x2. So when I differentiate with respect to x2, I get minus 1 for the top component and just x1 for the second component. And yeah. So, um, essentially the point is this, to push forward the vector under the mapping, we use the components of the Jacobian matrix to tell us how the vectors get pushed forward. They specifically tell us how to rotate them. Um, okay, so I mean, the rest is details, but that, that's essentially it. Now, so here's... Here's the thing, for an isometry, so let f from r to n be an isometry, then we have the following, I mean we have f of x, um, right, equal to a rotation matrix times x plus a. By the way, um, I've made a point of writing brackets r for the matrix up to this point. I'm going to stop doing that because it's really annoying. And um, so typically speaking, people just use the same letter for the transformation and the matrix. Um, so I'm engaging in that abuse of notation at this point. But if you'd like, you could write brackets around r because I'm thinking of r as a matrix here. So. Specifically, the formula here, if we look at the ith component of this, what is it? So this would be something like sum over j, right, of r, let's say, i, j, x upper j, plus a um, upper i. Right? I mean, that's the formula. So, in other words, this is f upper i. That's the formula for the ith component function of an isometry. Let's calculate the Jacobian matrix of it. What is it? Partial f i, partial x, let's say k. So we have partial, partial x, k of what? Sum over j. These numbers, r, i, j, which characterize the rotation, right? Plus a, j. a, i, rather. So what happens when we differentiate a, i? It's a constant, right? Those are zero. And r, i, j, that's a, those are numbers. Those pull out. So what I have is the sum over j of r, i, j, partial x, j, partial x, k. What is partial x, j, partial x, k? Well, that's the Kronecker delta. What? Kronecker delta jk. So in summary, what we have here is that partial f i partial xk is equal to r ik. In other words, the Jacobian matrix of an isometry is just its orthogonal part.
But let me just point. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Which implies, of course, that f star, right, f star of v is actually just equal to r star of v. So to push forward by an isometry is simply to push forward by its orthogonal piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it makes tons of sense. If you just work out some examples with specific formulas for the isometry. Yeah, I can see how that works because essentially like the orthogonal is like the only thing that you could actually do stuff that you could do to it. So that it would be your axis, right? So yeah. I mean, here's a super cheesy proof of the theorem I'm about to state. Here's a curve, right? Here's the curve mapped under the isometry, right? Yeah. Sure. So if this is V, so then... That's v right. So, oh, so you're saying V has to be orthogonal? So this is F, F star V, like that. Wait, so there are not, so V's are orthogonal? V's orthogonal. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm not saying that V is the velocity vector. V could be any vector. Oh. Um, the, but the push, the point, that, that's the thing is this, um, well, this holds for any vector is the point. Like this was not because this, calc this calculation um, actually doesn't need for that to be the velocity vector. Um, the theorem is essentially this, the push forward under an isometry of alpha prime is F composed with alpha prime. The push forward of the acceleration is the acceleration of the composed map, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The push forward of the n minus one derivative of the function is the n minus one derivative. But this, this, this theorem, this is theorem um, 3.22 in the notes. This is only good for an isometry. If you um, if you try to push forward, like it's always the case that the push forward of the velocity is the velocity of the composed curve. All right, like that's the general truth, but it's not true for acceleration, for the jerk, for higher derivatives, for an arbitrary map. But for an isometry, you end up just rotating the derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative, and so forth and so on. And I say rotating, but I should also include reflecting. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that. I mean, um, I mean, we're working in Rn, so there can be at most n linearly independent derivatives at a point. I'm kind of limited. I kind of have to get back where I started after n. That's for sure. But um, okay, so moving along here. So, uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. So that naturally leads into the, the frame. Um, uh, well, anyway, this is theorem. What did I say it was? Theorem 3.22. So I'll let you look at the proof of that. It, it actually ties more into the section I'm skipping. At this point, I'm going to get to section 3.3, and I'm going to be a little bit more concrete, all right? And um, so one thing I haven't said anything about yet today is the fact that translations give us what's called a transitive action. So um, a group can act on a set. It's called a group action. And um, if you take a point in the set, and you can move that point to any other point in the set by some group element, then that group action is said to be transitive. For example, translations are a transitive group action because the set of, like the subgroup of translations is transitive because if you give me any point, 
I can, you know, you give me any one point, I can move it anywhere else. You know, um, in contrast, like the orthogonal group is not transitive because, not on all of our three anyway, because I can't move, I, I'm stuck on spheres, right? I can only move a point with a rotation, with an orthogonal transformation. If I'm distance three and I do an orthogonal transformation, I'm still distance three from the origin when I started, you know. But um, if we work with the full isometry group, then we have translations to play with, which means we can always, if you give me one point in Rn, or let's say R3 for the sake of discussion at this point going further, you give me two points in R3, I can find an isometry that moves one point to another, right? Because I could use translation. I can just translate one point to the other. But there's more. If you give me, if I take a point with a frame, and you give me another point with a different frame, there exists an isometry to move from one point to the other and to rotate that frame into the other. So let me kind of give you a picture. Here's P. Let's say with, I'll say E3, E2, E1, just for the sake of a picture, right? And then over here, let's say there's Q. And over here I've got, let's see, I use Fs, so like F3, um, F2, F1, just for the sake of this, you know, illustration. My claim is that there is an isometry, phi, which maps that point to that point, and it rotates frame E into frame F. We can call this theorem transfer of frame by isometry. It's my theorem 3.3.1. How are we going to build, how can we build this isometry? You actually have homework problems where you have to do it. So it's worth thinking through the mechanics of it so we can kind of figure it out together. Um, so let's see here. First of all, I want to move P to Q, right? So it seems like the translation by what? Translation by A for A equal to what? How about Q minus P, right? Because if we have T, A, of P, what do we get? We get P plus Q minus P, what happens? We get Q, right? So that translation, if we translate by Q minus P, we move from the point P to the point Q. Right? Then what would the what would the laziest thing to try to do is to is to then use the rotation, right? So we we, we think about we move from here to here, right? And then we, we want to rotate, right? So how about if we make the rotation of E1 equal to F1, the rotation of E2 equal to F2. And I say rotation, but I mean orthogonal transformation. It's, it's, it's a vice I have. I'm working to fix it, but I'm not, I'm not there yet, folks. So I think if I, if I was to do that, you know, that would mean that the push forward, right, the push forward of E1 equals F1, the push forward of E2 would be F2, the push forward of E3 would be F3 if I, if I still constructed my rotation, right? Because the push forward of an isometry is just the orthogonal, I mean the rotational piece, right? I mean, the orthogonal piece, yes, I should have stuck with it. Okay, so I figured out what A should be. What should R be? Oh, and I and I. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I'm. I, I you know I, I guess to be careful here, I really should maybe put this here. I'm saying the 
And by that I mean the, the um, coordinate vector of the basis. So I, I think that would be like the row of the attitude matrix written as a column vector is what that would mean specifically what I just wrote. Mm -hmm. But what's the formula for R? I mean, this is a this is a a, 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 a rough draft of what we want to do, but I want a formula for R. What's the formula? Oh, but this is an abstract general frame. Like, it's any all we all I'm saying is e1, e2, e3. I want them to be. Let's say that they're orthogonal. All right. So. If you have, I don't know if you guys do this or not, but if you have three equations like this and they all share the same coefficient matrix, you can regroup them as a single matrix equation like so. Well, skipping a step here. So I could rewrite this as one big old three by three matrix equation, right? So many parentheses. I regret my life. That's not true. Um, actually, I'm enjoying this very much, but so many parentheses. Oh, yeah. Did you know this about matrix multiplication? If you have like A, B1, A, B2, A, B3, A, A, B1, B2, B3 being vectors. Properties matrix multiplication that's important to know is you can pull A out like this. It is true and extremely useful for differential equations and lots of things, but here it lets me pull out R. So R times, let's say, I'm just going to call that the E matrix. <laughs> is equal to the F matrix, if you don't mind. <laughs> I'm going to call this thing F matrix for the sake of discussion here. Now this, this F matrix, it's the matrix of coordinate vectors for the basis. To solve for R, I just multiply both sides by the transpose of this matrix. Yeah. Well, yes. So that. Well, the thing is, this is the identity matrix because of a bit of linear algebra. The, if the frame is an orthogonal frame, in other words, it's an orthonormal basis. It follows that when you concatenate the coordinate vectors, they actually form an orthogonal matrix, which again has the A transpose. It has the property that this times it transposes the identity, which gives us, so your intuition's right. Um, but here it is. I mean, that is the matrix that we want. Yep. Um, yeah, you could, you could do it for Rn, uh, but, um, I mean, I'm doing it for R3 because I think you guys have suffered enough with my Rnification of things. Um, but there is a proof. So in the notes, in the notes, I took a rather different approach to this and, um, maybe I need to look at that. Hmm. Oh. Oh yeah, I said something and then I ignored it. I shouldn't have ignored it. We should use our attitude matrices. I don't think this is wrong, right? 
but we should also try to understand this. I mean, this gives you a prescription for how to calculate the R, but let's see how to calculate R from the attitude matrices. Um, see, because um, so, all right. This right here, what is, I, I said this before, but R of E1, that is, um, not E1, but no, well, E1, rather. This is, in fact, row one of the attitude matrix written as a column. So what that really is, is R times column one of the attitude matrix transpose. And this is R times column two of the attitude matrix transpose. And then R times column three of the attitude matrix transpose. And then that we can... Right, well, if, yeah, um, and I said column, I meant row. Doofus. Goodness gracious. Row one. Row one transposed. The transpose of a row is a column. So what we have is row one as the row one transform, row one of A transpose is the first column. Row two of A transpose as the second column. Row three of A transpose as the third column of this matrix, which I have previously called E, right? So this is R A transpose. In other words, finally, had a thought in my head, the E is the transpose of the attitude matrix. So when you're working one of these problems, perhaps you already have the attitude matrix sitting around, because we talked about how to find that before, right? So row one the I mean, to be clear, that transpose is on row one. The transpose is, it's the transpose of this. But column one of the transpose is row one of the matrix, which is transposed. <laughs> anyway, in retrospect, we have this is equal to B transpose, A transpose transpose, also known as B transpose A. And here I'm introducing B as attitude. I heard that. You okay? Was that the table? Goodness gracious. You know, I have that feeling at night a lot. I'm just walking around my house and I find ways to hurt myself that I didn't even know existed. Like you just move a piece of furniture or something and then all of a sudden corners are like closer to your feet somehow. Exact your, their revenge upon your toes. Anyway, in particular, Fi is equal to B I 1 U 1 plus B I 2 u2 plus b i3 u3, like that kind of attitude matrix, they're the coefficients needed to expand the f basis in terms of the Cartesian frame. So there is a, another way to look at it. Um, and on page 68, I prove this. I prove that the push forward, I 
prove that the push forward of EI is equal to um, FI uh, but up, but up, but up, but up, where I have defined phi how. where phi of x is defined to be rx plus q minus rp. Uh, all right, so this is an annoyance. Whether which translation you want depends on whether you do it first or you do it second. You see, it doesn't commute whether you translate first and then rotate versus rotate then translate. Like it, it, the order matters. Um, but here, with this R equal to B transpose A, all right. If you set R equal to B transpose A, you can prove the push forward of EI is FI. I've kind of backwards derived it from this picture and this argument, but a, a, a stone cold gory um, fighting through the notation and details proof is given on page 68. It's ten steps. There's a lot of notation going on here, admittedly, all right, but there it is. All right. And I would put that up on the projector and show it to you guys, but it, the projector in here is funky. It's like all yellowy and stuff, so it's not worth our time. That's why I'm not doing that. Otherwise, I would be, you know. Um, so an example with numbers. <laughs> Hooray. So here's one. E1, 1 over the square root of 2, U1, plus 1 over square root of 2, U2. E2, same, but with minus. E3, I'll just let be U3. All right, so that's my E basis, my F basis. 1 over root 3, u1 plus u2 plus u3. This should be a familiar vector from today's homework. Um, f2, 1 over root 2, u1 minus u3, and f3, 1 over root 6, u1 minus 2, u2 plus u3. All right. So here's an E-frame and an F-frame. And from these, now you understand. Um, OK, well, actually, no, I, I should shut up. I mean, you can imagine generalizing these things to where the frames have a variable. You know, they vary from point to point. But at the moment, we're actually talking about fixed um, these are not like variable frames, right? I mean, they're, they are what they are. So what I'm trying to say is there, there, there's no component functions here. Like generally speaking, we've defined attitude matrix so that the attitude matrix can be a matrix of functions. In our current application, the attitude matrix is going to be constant, right? Um, what's the attitude matrix here? A is what? And what's the attitude matrix for the F frame? B is what? Mm -hmm. But oh, there's no u ones. The the attitude matrix, the matrix just got numbers in it. Okay, so the same thing. Same uh huh. And then you have zero, zero, one. Very good. And then this one, we got one over root three, one over root three, right? 
1 over root 3. Very good. And then that's a six. <laughs> there you go. And um, you put these two guys together. R as, you know, um, B transpose A. Wait a minute. Oh yes, I did have that. B transpose A. <laughs> and when you multiply these matrices, what you get is 1 over root 6 plus 1 half. I'm going to put some dividers in here. 1 over root 6. 1 over root 6 minus a half. 1 over root 6 minus a half up here. The middle component, 1 over root 6. 1 over root 6 down here as well. Oh, 1 over root 6 plus a half. Another dividing line here. And then the third column is 1 over root 6. Minus 2 over root 6. And 1 over root 6. And let's see here, in the, I haven't stated the whole problem quite yet. Um, I wanted to actually find the isometry which moves that frame. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this one at P. That's worthless. This one's at P equal to 1, 1, 1. And I wanted to move it to Q equal to minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So this is this frame was at that point. I wanted to move that to that. Yeah, sure. So that means row one would be just column one, row two would be column two. Yep. So why in the first slot do we have one over root six plus one? So it, it it essentially means that we um take dot products of like this. So 1 over root 2 times 1 over root 3 is 1 over root 6, and then plus a half, because this times this gives me a half. Yeah. 0 times that gives me 0. No, I get what you're doing. No, I thought, I thought you were saying it's just No, it's, it's OK. I mean, there are various ways to look at that calculation. Um, let's see here. Continuing, RP, which I'm not going to write R again, but R times 1, 1, 1 is 1, 1, 1. Here works out too. I'm going to write it as this kind of vector. I mean, as a, as a row. It's 3 over root 6. 0, 3 over root 6. That's RP. Um, come on. Stupid paper. And so then... Here's the formula, p of x, well rather, p of x, y, z, what's it equal to? It's equal to r, which I'm not going to write again, times the matrix x, y, z, the column vector x, y, z, minus r, p. Um, see what I said, so minus, I said minus, I'm supposed to add q, right? Remember, minus RP, so minus this, and I, I was also supposed to add Q, right? Add Q, that was part of the formula, add Q. Q was, in this one, given to us to be minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So I think in my notes, I have put these together to get 
Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And um, yeah, there you go. So you can work that out. I mean, I'll write the first component. The first component will be like 1 over the square root of 6 plus 1 half times x plus 1 over the square root of 6 minus a half times y um, plus 1 over root 6 times z. And let's see here, what happens in the first component? I've got minus 3, minus 1, so minus 1, minus 3 over root 6. There you go. There's the first component of the formula for phi. And I'll let you find the formulas for the other two, but that's explicitly how you do it. Now, mm -hmm. rats. So that brings us to the next step in the game here. Which is, now this part is, uh, th this thing we just did with the A and the B transpose, that is n-dimensional. You could do that in n-dimensions. There's nothing inherently three-dimensional about that, except just that we had three things. This theorem, part of it is intrinsically three-dimensional. Here it is. Theorem, um, if you have an isometry on R3, all right? And we have vector fields V and W on R3. I don't think I've gotten, there's a nail under here. I just somehow, it's like this little nail under here. I just hook my uh, mic wire up on. I'm like, what? What's, what's snagging me? This is, this is a little bit dangerous. Like, this is like jagged. Like, this could get you. Why is that there? Man. Somebody, some, like somebody, uh, somebody's got it in for the math professors, but they're playing a long game. Like, they're willing to wait years on somebody. Like, eventually, one of them is going to get that their tetanus. I'll teach them. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, here it is, and this is really, this is beautiful. Um, the push forward under F of V dotted with the push forward under F of W is simply V dot W. Notice that I'm not stating it for an isometry now, I'm stating it for the push forward of the isometry. But this isn't surprising, really, because the push forward of the isometry is the rotational part, right? And that was an identity we proved for an origin-fixing fi origin isometry. So it's like not terribly surprising that that's true, but that doesn't take away from the coolness of it. F star of V cross F star W, and that's cross product in three dimensions. Okay, that kind of cross product is the determinant of the push forward times the cross product, oh, well, times the push forward of the cross product. Yeah. And this means determinant of the Jacobian matrix of F. That's what's meant there. Okay. The, the, the proof is, 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 is pretty much immediate from what we've already been through. Um, like, essentially, it's just this. F star of V is 
RV and F star W is RW. Now, that I'm abusing notation a bit here in the sense of like, really I need to think about the coordinate vectors for W and the coordinate vectors for V, but that's essentially it. And then if you'll allow me this, so F star V dot F star W, what happens? You've got RV dot RW, but again, this is V transpose R transpose R W. Seen this before. That's V transpose W, which is V dot W. And again, this is using an abuse of notation, which is explained in more detail if you read my notes, okay? But um, now, uh, let's see here. Now if we look at F star of V cross F star W, and we take the dot product of that, right, with U, um, with UJ, Well, then that's the um, determinant, right, of F star V, F star W, and UJ. And for the sake of anticipating the next step, instead of writing uj here, I'm going to write r, r transpose uj, okay? Yeah, this is the triple, there's a triple product identity. We can take a triple product for a determinant of the corresponding vectors. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm abusing notation in the sense that I'm trading the abstract vector f star v for its coordinate vector. That's the abuse of notation that's being made here. Um, now, it's the same abuse that we make when we write like 1 comma 1 comma 1 rather than partial x plus partial y plus partial z. It's that abuse. But um, I think here we have r v. RW, R, R transpose UJ. You notice we've got R, R, R. So by that identity of matrix multiplication I was mentioning a couple minutes ago, pull out the R. And Well, I need that R there, otherwise I can't pull it out. I mean, I need an R in every column to factor it out. Once I do that, though, then I've got the product of determinants. So I've got determinant of R, determinant of V, W, R transpose UJ. Now, R is the Jacobian of F. So that is the determinant of F star. And this here is V cross W. Um, well, how to say that? Let's see here. Dot R transpose UJ. And um, I explain that that is, in fact, equal to like this. I explained that we can rewrite that as F star of um, V cross W dot UJ. In fact, that's identical to that. And so once you have that this is equal to that, since this identity is true, 
for all j, it then follows that this is true. Because if you can do it for arbitrary j, you've proved that the components of f star v cross f star w are equal to the components of the determinant of f star, um, you know, uh, v cross w. <clears throat> words. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. I need the, it's not just that part. It's the whole, it's this. Uh, sorry. Yeah. To show you that. <laughs> V, <laughs> v cross W dot R transpose UJ is equal to R. Now I pulled a fast one on you guys. <laughs> now that's F star. Now the question, so there's one, now I have, now I've reduced the problem to showing yet another thing, <laughs> right? What, did, what, what manner of madness was this, right? Yeah, I know, and why did the transpose, how did the transpose become a, uh, you know? Well, that was an identity. When you put the R back in, it's the identity. So here, here's, here's something you may or may not have ever seen before. But if I have a mapping, uh, a linear map, uh, let's say a matrix, A, X dot Y, right? Then this is A, X transpose Y, right? But that's X transpose A transpose Y, right? Which, why not keep it over there? Now this does not assume, this does not assume anything about the matrix. It doesn't have to be an orthogonal matrix. This is just an, an identity for a matrix. And I've, that's what I used in the upper board. So like here, you could think of this as being a transpose. And then it came over here and it became a. <coughs> V cross W is playing the role X did, and UJ is playing the role Y did in my calculation. But that's just a general identity for dot products and matrix multiplication, which you may or may have never seen before. I don't, I don't know, you know. I know I hadn't seen it, but anyway, there you go. So what does this mean about the push forward of an isometry? What does it do to the vector fields? It looks like it it keeps them this it keeps the dot products between them the same yeah. right it preserves the dot products it also preserves the cross product provided this was one right so this is either plus or minus one for an isometry because it's an orthogonal transformation the determinant of an orthogonal transformation is plus or minus one so either we're preserving the cross product or we're like flipping it over with an isometry. The ones which preserve the cross product are called, orienta are called orientation preserving. The ones that flip the cross product over are orientation reversing. So like reflections can, re can, can mess up the orientation. If you extend this to um, n dimensions, the determinant still has that meaning. Like if you have n vectors, if you give me n vectors and n dimensions and you want to say they're positively oriented, what that means is you take the vectors 